I'm talk about chemistry today because learning about hair would not be complete without knowing how our chemicals are, chemicals are going to react on it or how it's going to react to the chemicals. We do have certain chemicals when mixed together are flammable. We certainly wouldn't want to put that on somebody's hair at the same time. So right now we're going to talk about the chemistry. Later on we'll study about the composition of the hair and what to do to keep it as healthy as we can and yet get the looks we want such as permanent waving, hair coloring, hair lightening. So chemistry is the science that deals with the composition, structure, and properties of matter and how matter changes under different chemical changes, circumstances. First we're going to talk about organic chemistry and we see on uh, advertising a lot now about organic substances. If you'll go to the store and look at your shampoos, you're going to see coconuts and pineapples and all kind of fruits, kiwis and all that advertised in our shampoos. They say it's natural. Organic chemistry deals with the chemicals that contain carbon. These substances were once living substances and the majority of our products are made from organics. That does not necessarily make them good. One example of an organic chemical that wouldn't ordinarily be good if you've ever used homemade soap. It is made from hog fat or lard and lye. And lye is the same thing that Drano is made out of. And that is all organic substances. The inorganic branch of chemistry contains no carbon. It was never living and some of our products are made from that. First we want to talk about matter and this is so we can get into the business of knowing how one thing reacts with another and about chemical and physical changes. Matter is said to be anything that occupies space. It can be in solid form, liquid form, or gaseous form. And a good example of taking a matter from the, to the different states is if we take water and we use a lot of water in cosmetology and as water it's a liquid we can take that same water and freeze it it becomes what? A solid. We can let it melt and it's right back to a liquid. We can boil it in the steam that comes up and you'll see it gather on the lid of the pot is it's it's what? Gas. It's a gas. But as it gathers on the lid of the pot it's a liquid again. So what, the reason we're talking about that is we've made no change in our water. We've changed the state of it from solids, liquids to gas and back to liquid, but we didn't change it at all. So that's a physical change. And when we do shampoos and sets on the hair, that is also a physical change because if we don't like the results of that, we can go wet it, start back again. But later on we're going to talk about chemical changes that we make to the hair, such as hair coloring. And we can dye the hair black, and then if we don't like it, we can remove it. But we can never remove that that hair has been through a chemical change. It's going to feel different. It's going to act different. So that's why we talk about matter. An element is a pure substance. It's made of one thing only. Each element has a chemical symbol. O for oxygen, C for carbon. The one the ladies like to talk the most about is gold. And the most confused thing on this unit is elements and atoms. Now I'm going to put you a formula on the board of how we come up with things. So atom is the smallest part of an element that can exist and we can still identify it. An element is the simplest and that's where our confusion comes in. An element is the simplest. And you may want to write this down. An atom is the smallest part of an element that can exist and we can still identify it. So when we have an element, we can have one atom or we can have billions of atoms. All right, we got that? Next we have molecule. And molecule is simply plural of atom. That means there is more than one atom present. How do we know now since we've put two atoms together what it is? Is it an elemental molecule or is it a compound molecule? 
we have to go back to our formulation and see if we've got oxygen plus oxygen it's what what kind of molecule it's an elemental molecule and we keep adding oxygen it stays an elemental molecule but for our purposes in cosmetology we mix hydrogen and oxygen a lot so what would that be right a compound and what do we have when we mix hydrogen and oxygen let's put it like this and assemble H2O what is that water but we still have only two elements hydrogen and oxygen but now it's become a compound when we just say a molecule all we know is that we've got more than one atom we've got two atoms put together next we want to talk about the states of matter and go back to what we were discussing earlier about the physical properties and chemical properties if we've got hydrogen plus oxygen it looks different than oxygen or hydrogen by themselves that would be physical properties but if we come in and added something else to it just like if we want to get hydrogen peroxide we would have H2O2 we have still got the same substances we've made no chemical change but when we add something else to it that we can't reverse easily we've made a chemical change does that make sense physical we've still got the same thing such as in cosmetology shampoo and say it we've got a physical change we can easily reverse it but we do a hair color that's a chemical change not only does the hair change but the color that we put on the hair changed also pure substances have fixed composition definite proportions and distinct properties what we're talking about with definite proportions water is going to always be H2O hydrogen peroxide is going to always be H2O2 and the properties are going to be the same we know that oxygen is oxygen hydrogen is hydrogen so that is our pure substances elements are pure substances they contain one thing only we said that a while ago we have our chemical compounds H2O H2O2 two or more atoms of different elements give us a compound that compound is going to have definite proportions and distinct properties a physical mixture is different than a chemical because it is only united physically a good example of that would be sugar and salt I would hate to know I mixed a cup of sugar and a cup of salt and then had to separate it but I could because they're not chemically bound the next thing we're going to talk about is solutions and we use solution upon solution upon solution in the salon so I want to put you a formula on the board that will show you how to remember what a solution is and what the parts of that is a solution is made up of a solute with a solvent how do we know which is which get my pen what is the solute it's what is going to be dissolved so what is the solvent what's doing the dissolving and we wind up with a solution what is the most commonly used solvent water it is capable of dissolving so many things it's called the universal solvent is it the solvent in all of our <coughs> solutions no it is not the solvent in all of our solutions it is the solvent in the bulk of our solutions in alcohol sometimes used as the solvent so solute plus solvent equals solution and a problem we're going to run into with solutions is we have to have a lot of oil to put on the hair you know a hair gets dry and we've got to have some oil and oil and water do not mix water plus water or water plus alcohol will mix and they're called miscible they are liquids that are mutually soluble 
but water and oil is an immiscible and we run into problems because we've got to have the water in our solutions and we've got to have the oil in order to address dry hair and dry skin. So we have something called a suspension. It's usually not going to be transparent as our solutions were. It's going to be have color to it or look milky and it will separate over time. And we don't really like shaking up these products before we use them. So science has come up with something called an emulsifier. We can put oil and water in a solution and put an emulsifier in there and we come up with an emulsion. A good example of an emulsion would be the conditioner you use after shampooing your hair. What product or what substance do you think the emulsifier might be in a conditioner? I don't think the book probably told you that. You ever, how many of y'all use conditioners? You ever notice when you first start rinsing it that it bubbles up kind of like shampoo? You think maybe soap might be the thing that we that's put in there so that the oil and the water will stay mixed? Possibly. Possibly. Do you do any dishwashing? <laughs> All of y'all know about dishwashing? You got greasy dishes and you got a sink full of water. And if you didn't put detergent in there, the dishes wouldn't get clean because oil and water, again, don't get along together. But soap will get along with water, and it will get along with oil. And that's because it contains surfactants, which are surface active agents. The head of the soap molecule will get along with water, and it's called hydrophilic. The tail of the soap molecule will get along with oil. It's called lipophilic. You can always keep them separated. Hydrophilic gets along with water. Water is part hydrogen. We also have what we call oil and water suspensions or solutions. This is when we have some oil in a big water base. Some examples would be mayonnaise. Some of our products that are oil and water are color, shampoos, and some of our conditioners. We also have water and oil solutions. An example of that is cold cream. Which should be the most expensive, oil and water or water and oil? Water, water and oil. So we want to keep those separate. Why would water and oil be a more expensive product than oil and water? Water and oil, we've got a lot of oil with some water droplets dispersed in it. Oil is a lot more expensive substance now than water is. Some other products we have are ointments, paste, pomades, and styling waxes. These are usually just physical mixtures, and if need to be, they could be separated. <clears throat> we also use alcohol in a lot of our products. Sometimes that's not a good thing. It evaporates easily. Y'all remember cleaning and sanitizing the tables and windows Friday? You sprayed that on, you wiped it, it dried. Why did it dry so quickly? We know water wouldn't have dried that quickly. Because it evaporates right into the air. Isopropyl and ethyl are volatile, meaning that they evaporate easy. But some alcohols do not. And that's the alcohols we find in some of our products. And that's like cetyl alcohol or cedaryl alcohol and they're called non-volatile. Then we want to talk about our alkaline amines. We're going into the pH scale now so I want to write some things on the board so you understand why we're concerned with it. Most of you know that pool water, spa water and all that has to be kept to a certain pH. But the fact of the matter is the hair, skin and nails has a pH although the book tells us that it must be an aqueous solution to have a pH. But our body secretes oils and sweats and gives us what we call an acid mantle. So I'm going to show you on the pH scale where our hair and skin falls and why we need to study about what happens with acids when we put them on there and what happens for um, alkalines when we put them on there and how to get our hair back to its normal acid state. So the first thing we want to do 
is decide where the hair and skin fall. And different books say different ranges. So usually I put from 4.5 through 5.5 just as a range. That's our hair, skin, and nails. We get off over here in the alkaline range. We have substances such as perm solutions, relaxers. And we have an area on each end of our scale that we do not use. And that's from 0 to 3 and from 11 to 14. And the reason we don't use these is the stronger chemicals are on each end. It doesn't come from here and get stronger. It comes from here and here, and they come in, and the weakest is number seven, which is called a neutral. Distilled water is neutral. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the hair so you'll understand what's going on with it and why we're concerned with the pH. The hair is made up of a medulla, which is the inside of the hair strand. It's surrounded by the cortex. The cortex contains all of our bonds that holds the hair together. It contains all of our coloring matter. And then on top of that is cuticle scales or imbrications. And they look just like they sound. When we think about scales, we think about the scales on a fish's back. And that's just how our cuticle scales are. They're translucent. They're put there only for protection. When they're in their acid state, they're closed down like this on the hair. But when we come and put a perm solution on it, our alkalis raise the cuticle scales. Alkalis break the bonds that's in the hair. And this allows us to change hair colors. It allows us to make straight hair curly, to make curly hair straight, whatever we need to do. But when we do this, we take the hair away from its normal, healthy pH. And this is where we make some mistakes. You hear people talk about getting their hair fried. It looks so fried and burned after we left the salon. They forget to come back over here and put an acid on it. Acids close scales. So now the hair is protected again. also reforms bonds. And in the case of a um, permanent wave, we've rolled the hair, this hair was straight, we've rolled it, we've processed it. Now we want to make it stay in that reformed state, right? So we come back with an acid. So from zero to seven is our acids. From seven to 14 are our alkalis. And I'm gonna give you another couple of terms for alkali, because different books will refer to it in different ways. It may be called an alkaline substance. It may be called a base. But anytime you come and use an alkaline substance on the hair, you need to follow it back with an acid. Blow-dry styling also raises cuticle scales, so you feel your hair getting rough. You need a little bit of conditioner on it, and you need to check your conditioner and make sure you are using an acid conditioner. This is how we keep the hair healthy. Also on the pH scale, we said seven is water, but every time we move from one number to another, it is tenfold. So the book tells us if we consider the hair to be five, a six would be 10 times as strong as a five. A seven would be 100 times as strong. So a lot of scientists believe that even water, you know, just wet in your hair, is going to raise the cuticle scales and do some damage to the hair. So it's according to how you feel about it. I know that water does raise the cuticle scales because I've had years of experience of feeling of hair, and that's one of the first things you're going to have to learn about hair is a lot of what we do is not done by sight. It's by feel. And how does this product make the hair feel? You know, sometimes we want the hair roughed up a little bit because people sometimes want fat hair. And to get fat hair, you raise the cuticle scales. And it appears to be fatter then, but it's rougher. 
So we want to talk about ion, and I'm going to give you the definition of pH. And this is something you don't have to worry about being on a test or whatever, because for our purposes, we're worried about acids and alkalines and what they do. If you'll notice, the P is small. It stands for potential. The H is uppercase, meaning it's a chemical symbol. It stands for hydrogen. And the definition of pH is the potential hydrogen ion concentration of a given substance. <laughs> so what an ion is, it is an atom or molecule that carries an electrical charge. And ionization is the separating of a substance into ions. These ions have opposite electrical charges. An ion with a negative electrical charge is called an anion. And an ion with a positive electrical charge is called a cation. Now let me give you an example of how we have electrical charges. If you've ever slipped across your car seat and grabbed the handle, you felt a little shock, and that was from your, um, the charge from your ions. Or if you go to turn on TV, and I don't think anybody ever gets this anymore because they have the remote control, but used to we'd walk across the carpet and turn on the TV, we'd feel a little spark. And it's the same thing from these positive and electrical charges. In pure water, some of the water molecules naturally ionize into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So the pH scale simply measures these. The hydrogen ion is acidic and the hydroxide ion is alkaline. We talked a minute ago about aqueous solutions have a pH and without water there would be no pH, but we do know from secretions on the skin and we know from feel like during the winter, our skin feels rougher and we constantly want to put cream on there and it's where we get it out of its normal acid balance. All right, so let's talk a little more in depth about acids. All acids owe their chemical reactivity to hydrogen. You can tell an acid by taste, it will taste sour. You can test it with litmus paper, it will turn blue to red. An example is thioglycolic acid. And if you're wondering what thioglycolic acid is, it's the stuff that smells so bad when you walk into a salon and people are getting a permanent solution, a permanent wave. Alkalis owe their chemical reactivity to hydroxide. They will turn blue litmus paper to red. They taste bitter. They will feel slippery and soapy. Some examples of alkalis are lye or sodium hydroxide. Lye, as we mentioned it a while ago, is in Drano, or drain openers. Sodium hydroxide is also in chemical relaxers. That's to take curl out of the hair. It's also in hair removers such as Neat or Nair. So an acid neutralizes an alkali, an alkali neutralizes an acid. And that's why we come together in the middle of the scale where our weaker solutions are. Anything from 0 to 3 or from 11 to 14 is capable of dissolving the hair. Battery acid, if you've ever seen anybody mess with a car battery and get it on their clothes, it just eats it up right away, it's down on your acid end. And lye is up on your 13 to 14 range. And if you've ever gotten that on you, you know it will eat your clothes up. It will eat your skin up too. All right, we want to talk about our... Um, acid alkali neutralization reactions and that's what we were talking about there but we want to talk about oxidation reduction or redox reactions and no chemistry and cosmetology would be complete without that and we we studied oxidation if you remember in bacteriology or in decontamination we use oxidation to kill bacteria Oxidation reduction reactions or redox are responsible for the chemical changes that we use for hair colors, lighteners, perm solutions, and the neutralizers. Now I want to stop and explain that to you a little bit so you'll understand what we're talking about. Whenever we put a perm solution on somebody's hair, it's reduction reaction. So we say we're reducing the hair down to make it do what we want to do want it to do. Because if you've noticed fixing your own hair, you know that it has a tendency to want to do what it wants to do. And you have to fight it. So we put the thioglycolic acid on there and it reduces the hair down. 
Now we've got the bonds broken. We've got the hair out of its normal pH range. We've raised the cuticle scales. And now we've got to do something to take the hair back to its normal pH to reform the bonds and close the cuticle scales. And we're going to do that with redox or more commonly with oxidation. We put our neutralizer on there and it's named aptly. It's going to neutralize that alkaline substance we put on there. The chemical services that we take for granted are not possible if we don't use oxidation reduction reactions and we just talked about those. We reduced it, then we oxidized it. It's redox. So oxidation is a chemical reaction that combines an element or compound with oxygen to produce an oxide. When oxygen is added to a substance, some heat is almost always produced. Chemical reactions that are characterized by or formed with the giving off of heat are called exothermic. Now, I want to call your attention to this because this bothers me a lot every time I see it. Exothermic. We open a perm solution and we find three things in there. We find our waving solution, we find our neutralizer, and we find our little tube of activator. And we read our directions and it tells you to put the tube of activator in the processing solution, or part A. So you take the lid off the little tube, you dump it into bottle A, and you immediately feel the bottle getting hot. That is an exothermic heat. Endothermic heat would be when we just applied some solution to the hair, put a plastic cap over them, and put them under the dryer to get the heat from there. And that confuses me. So I'm telling you it confuses me because it's going to confuse you. To me, exothermic ought to be external. And endothermic should be coming from within like we just added that and the bottle was hot when we applied it. So they're just the opposite. So I'm going to call your attention to it. Exothermic permanent waves produce heat because of oxidation. Slow oxidation also takes place in oxidation hair colors and permanent wave neutralizers. If we pay close attention, you'll notice an increase in the temperature of oxidation hair colors after the peroxide is added. So this is telling us, although we don't have that activator that causes exothermic, we do feel the chemical reaction that produces heat when we mix up our hair colors. Combustion is the rapid oxidation of a substance accompanied by the production of heat and light. Lighting a match is an example of rapid oxidation. You cannot have a fire without oxygen. This is why sometimes they tell us to throw a blanket on top of the fire. It doesn't get any air. It can't burn anymore. So when a substance is combined with oxygen, it's oxidized. But when we take oxygen away from a substance, it is reduced. So the chemical reaction then is called reduction. An oxidizing agent is a substance that releases oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide is an example of an oxidizing agent because it contains the extra oxygen. Remember H2O2? When it gives up its oxygen, what does it become? H2O2. Water. We want to remember that when we start using our hydrogen peroxide solution because it gives up its oxygen so readily that if we take the lid off of a bottle of hydrogen peroxide and leave it sitting on the counter back there for a few hours, what have we got when we go back? Water. It gives it up just that freely. <coughs> hydrogen peroxide can actually be thought of as water with an extra atom of oxygen. When hydrogen peroxide is mixed with an oxidation hair color, oxygen is then added to the hair color, and the hair color is oxidized. At the same time, oxygen is removed from the hydrogen peroxide, so the hydrogen peroxide becomes reduced. We're reducing it down to water. We're calling the hair color our reducing agent. So oxidation and reduction always occur at the same time and are referred to as redox reactions. So redox is simply a contraction or a short form of, form of reduction, oxidation. In redox reactions, the oxidizing agent is reduced and the reducing agent is oxidized. So we've considered only 
oxidation as the addition of oxygen, but reduction only as the removal of oxygen. But oxidation can also result from the removal of hydrogen. And reduction can result from the addition of hydrogen. That's where we got confused, wasn't it? Gives us a thought process there. Permanent waving is an example of redox reaction. Permanent waving solution breaks certain bonds in the hair through a reduction reaction that adds hydrogen atoms to the hair. And you have to think now that hair has hydrogen atoms in it also. So we're adding hydrogen atoms and we already had hydrogen atoms. In this reaction, the hair is reduced and the perm solution is oxidized. Neutralizers then oxidizes the hair by removing the extra hydrogen atoms that we put in there and oxidizing. So the hair is oxidized, the neutralizer is reduced. Oxidation is the result of either the addition of oxygen or the loss of hydrogen. Reduction is the result of either the loss of oxygen or the addition of, hi of hydrogen. All right, we want to go back and talk about some of our other products or some of our product ingredients. And I keep a dictionary back there for y'all cosmetic dictionary that has what this substance is and what effect it will have on the hair and skin. And in all of our products, if you turn your bottles around and look on the back, the most that's contained in that bottle is listed first. That's the biggest portion of what's in there and then in descending form. And if you will notice on most of our products, that is going to be water. So now we know where water falls on the pH scale and what effect it has. Alcohol is another product, and sometimes that's a bad thing because alcohol is drying to the hair and skin. But sometimes it's a good thing, as we talked about a while ago. Alcohol is readily evaporating. It's a colorless liquid obtained by the fermentation of starch, sugar, and other carbohydrates. Most of us are familiar with these evaporating alcohols. But you will encounter other kinds in your work, such as fatty alcohols. Where would we use a fatty substance? To condition. Some fatty alcohols are acetyl alcohol and cedaryl alcohol. They're non-volatile oils. Alkalinamines are substances used to neutralize acid or raise the pH of many hair products. They're often used in place of ammonia because there's less odor associated with their use. As we go into 101, which y'all are going to do this week, and start processing perms, we're going to learn to detect a lot by smells. And ammonia, it was nothing uncommon when I trained to get a permanent waving solution and we had this lady that comes in and her hair is very difficult to perm. So we would want our perm solution to be a little stronger than what we could buy. We would add ammonia to it, and that would boost the power up. It also boosted the pH level up, which made it more damaging to the hair. But her hair is in super good condition. It's resistant, and we boosted it up there. We just watched it carefully. Now, when we start processing, we not only have alkaline perms now, but we have acid perms. And it's easy to tell the difference. Acid perms do not contain ammonia or do not contain the amount of ammonia that alkaline perms do. So when you walk out in the lab or you don't know what kind of perm you're putting on there, if it kind of burns your nose and has an ammonia smell, it is alkaline. If it smells like somebody has broke open two or three rotten eggs, it's acid because it's lacking that ammonia smell. Ammonia, then, is a colorless gas with a pungent odor. It's composed of hydrogen and nitrogen. It may be called ammonia water, and it is raised, used to raise the pH in permanent waving, hair coloring, and lightening substances. Raising the pH allows the solution to penetrate the hair. Ammonium hydroxide and ammonium theoglycolate are examples of ammonia compounds that are used to raise the pH. The difference in our permanent waving solutions today and the reason we don't add ammonia to them is because we can buy a perm anywhere from 4 up to about 13. So the range is covered. We don't need to alter the chemicals in them or raise the power. We can buy one strong enough. Glycerin is a sweet, colorless, oily substance formed by the decomposition of oils, fats, or fatty acids. Glycerin may be used as a solvent and it's in moisturizers that are used in skin and body creams. 
<coughs> excuse me, silicons are a special type of oil used in hair conditioners and as a water resistant lubricant for the skin. You may notice on some of your products now they'll begin to advertise silicons. Silicons are superior to plain oil because they are less greasy and they form a breathable film that does not cause comedons or blackheads. Do you notice when you put some creams on it does feel real oily and you feel slick and others just make you feel smooth? Notice the ingredients on the back. Volatile organic compounds or VOCs are two or more elements combined chemically. They contain carbon and evaporate very quickly so they are volatile. The most common VOC used in hairsprays is SD alcohol. We also need to remember when saying volatile, it would be flammable. So if we were standing there smoking or light a match or whatever and start spraying this hairspray, because I remember the teenage boys used to like to get hairsprays when it first come out and they'd light a cigarette lighter and start spraying that and flames would go everywhere. But we really don't want to do that when we've got a client sitting in front of that hairspray can. Some other chemicals that used to be used, and we want to discuss them because this is dangerous, and I did discuss this with y'all the other day in uh, decontamination, that's formaldehyde. So not only was formaldehyde used in our salon to keep our implements sanitary and disinfected, it used to be used in cosmetics as a preservative. So we were taking formaldehyde and rubbing it on our skin and putting it in our hair and all kind of stuff. And then they decided it may be a cancer-causing agent. Formaldehyde may also be known as formalin. It is toxic to inhale. It's a strong irritant and a carcinogenic, which means it may cause cancer. It also has certain allergic reactions, even in low concentrations. Y'all remember me showing you the Sterodry that we now use to keep our disinfected items? It does have a low amount of formaldehyde in it still. So we want to be really careful about breathing that in are picking up the containers and getting it on our skin because of its allergic possibilities. All right, questions? Thank you. Thank you.